Welcome back to another episode here with us. My name is Yvonne and today we have Lucy Nathanson and I'm super excited about Lucy's story because it's full of intuition, it's full of action, it's full of inspiration and it's full of passion. And I really think it'll leave you feeling like you know deep down what you've got to be doing. It's just that you need to act, you need to trust, you need to believe in yourself. And Lucy is a child therapist and she works with an anxiety disorder called selective mutism. So she really helps these children who often have issues speaking as a result of the anxiety, really break free from that and just find their voice and really just reintegrate back into society and and create harmonious families. She's uh, published over three books. She's got a YouTube channel. She's got courses. She's got the whole the whole shebang. And uh, she just really comes from a place of loving what, the work that she does and the impact that she's making. And she makes it very clear in this interview as to how she got there. And I think you will love that. I really think that is where the nugget lies in her story and, I, and you will come out so inspired. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Lucy. that you're here with us. I'm so excited for this episode because I really think you're going to shed so much light on what it's like when we follow our intuition and we just really accept the gifts that we are given and we take this path and uh, you know what sometimes even if it's uncertain we we make it into what what you've made it um, for you as well. So thank you so much for being here. This, This is a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate that you have invited me on your channel. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to dwell deeper. So let's kick things off on the lighter side. So why don't we understand, what, do you have, what did you have for breakfast this morning? <laughs> um, <laughs> nothing too exciting. Some toast <laughs> with some peanut butter. <laughs> so nothing oh, no. too elaborate, I'm afraid. It's pretty standard. I love peanut butter. Oh, the best. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, delicious, easy as well. <laughs> Sometimes I do have, you know, a smoothie and try to go a bit more, um, a bit more out. But yeah, today just standard. No, and you know what? Sometimes it's what you need to start the morning off is just some feel good food. So I love peanut butter. I'm with you. So why don't we dive right into g- giving everybody a little bit of your background story? And so as vulnerably as you feel comfortable, can you share a little bit about how this journey unfolded for you? Well. I suppose going back to my childhood, I didn't have a stereotypically normal childhood. So my dad died when I was seven years old and my mum went through her own personal challenges around that time as well. So as a result, I lived with my nan for the rest of my childhood. And so there was quite a lot of instability during that time. And now I can see that actually it really made me the person that I am today because I had these two very different influences on my life. So on the one hand, my mum is a very eccentric character. So she's very much her true self. She doesn't really follow social norms at all. (laughs) So she kind of just says what's on her mind in a very like um, innocent way. And she very much just just is is truly herself, her authentically herself. And my nan, on the other hand, is a very grounded person. So she's very structured. She's always on time. But my mum is always late. <laughs> so I had my mum, who was is very much her true self, but always late. There's not much wasn't much structure in my life. And my nan, on the other hand, who is very grounded, everything's in control, everything's always on time. And my nan really instilled that work ethic into me. So she taught me to always try my best. I remember she'd always say to me, whatever the result, Lucy, as long as you try your best, I'm proud of you. Mm. And I put that quote in my Eliza book in the acknowledgement section because it really impacted me so for example when we go to parents evenings if I didn't get a good grade or the grade the the best grade she'd say to me Lucy do you try your best and I'd say yes and she'd say 
In that case, I'm proud of you. As long as you tried your best, I'm proud of you. So she really instilled that, that within me. And also this work ethic of doing your work and try, trying your best at all times, just like that, but really um, prioritizing your work. So whenever I'd get homework, she'd say, before you can go out and have fun with your friends, you need to do your homework. So if, all my friends would be out playing, in the streets back, back then that when people just that uh, and it will be playing board, board games and stuff and I'd be having to do my homework at home and only when I'd done my homework I was allowed to go out and at the time it was really frustrating but it really instilled that within me that 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 work ethic to the point that when I was at uni when I'd get an essay I'd start it immediately and start you know making it the best essay or the best assignment I can and everyone else would leave it to their work to the last minute and I'd never ever do that so I think having that influence really impacted me as well so both those two the be your true self just don't worry about what people think but also work hard try your best always put 110% in everything you do really really impacted me so I'm really grateful for both of those role models in my life and Aside from that, <laughs> so just a bit of, um, you said how, what's influenced me to uh, be, do what I do today. Uh, my mum is Polish and I actually experienced anxiety around talking in Polish. So my mum would speak to me in Polish and I'd respond in English. And when we'd visit family in Poland, family friends in Poland, I experienced this extreme anxiety and was not able to speak to them similarly to how children with selective mutism, uh, what, what children with selective mutism experience. So my uncles, aunties, cousins never heard me speak in Polish and I'd really feel unable to talk. So I feel like that experience enables me today to really empathise with children and really understand exactly what they're going through. And that feeling of being really unable to actually mm -hmm. talk so that was another key thing that impacted me and then um, I later on went on to study applied psychology and sociology at university which I absolutely loved it was an amazing experience and I then did my placement year and that was when I came across that first little boy with selective mutism which opened up this career that I have today but I didn't start Confident Children straight away full time. I worked as a psychology teacher for a few years while developing Confident Children on the side. So I was teaching for three days a week and I was developing Confident Children on the other four days a week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's pretty much um, a bit of background of my life story how that unfolded for you it's beautiful that you had the two influences and then fortunately and then you've turned that into kind of a beautiful part of your story is that the passing away of your of your father as well and and um wow so actually I, before we even go further into the into understanding how that all involved in more detail what i always like to refer to the little girl in us is there something that um you dreamed or aspired to becoming when you were little you know, I don't think there was anything specific that I wanted to be, but I knew that I wanted to work with children. Mm. And I have this, I'm a very um, animated, energetic person. <laughs> so I would say I wanted to be maybe a child's entertainer um, or maybe, oh, a big one, actually. I wanted to be at one point a TV presenter, maybe in Blue Peter, working on like a children's TV show, um, as a TV presenter. So I suppose actually it's quite funny because my job now is almost like a, mis like a, a mix of all of that. Mm -hmm. Because I work with children, but it's very much, um, you know, play based. Yeah. Interacting with them in a playful way. <laughs> yeah. But there's also the kind of the YouTube videos, the Facebook lives, so there's that side of it as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really interesting. And actually, Sorry, it's a sidetrack. No, um, I was watching a video that my dad took when I was about five years old and he was interviewing me. And in the video, he's saying, Lucy, when you're a grown up, what do you want to be? And I look at the camera and I say, when I'm big, I want to be a child again. 
and when I saw that video I literally was like oh my gosh like I'm not sure if it's just a coincidence but it felt quite profound to, to I'm yeah, honestly I'm like, oh my god this is oh but that's funny that as a child you were like I want to be a child I want to like it's like I wanted to continue this way it's so weird yeah it's so um Beautiful. I'm not sure whether yeah I wanted to keep that like playful side which I very much still have and I you know tap like into that tool. all the time in my work yeah wow that's amazing and so when you went into university how come you picked sociology and psychology oh wow um it was always a no-brainer really for me to especially psychology um I loved psychology from you know I always had an interest in child psychology um I my mum actually studied psychology while when I was a child she was studying at university when I was a child oh. and and I remember her write, it's strange, I don't know how I have a memory of this, but I really remember her writing assi like psychology assignments and um, talking about different experiments and you know, child development. So somehow I think the seeds might already have been planted. Yeah. yeah, and then as I was growing up, I just, it was just so interesting for me. Um, and I studied, of course, at, for A level at college, studied psychology, which again um, was just amazing. And I think for the first time, I found my subject. Yeah. At school, I wasn't really a, you know, I was a hard worker. I studied a lot and, you know, worked hard, but there were no subjects that I really loved. I just kind of did everything, got on with everything. But when I first started to study psychology, my, it just blew my mind. And I just got um, so interested. And actually, there was a program called Child of Our Time that was on TV. Um, and I was watching that maybe in, I don't know, when I was about 11 years old or something like that. And they were following a group of children who were all born in the, two, in the year 2000. And they were monitoring the children's development. Um, so how that, you know, the way they were developing when they're one years old and how their, you know, their attachment to their mum and their dad and how their personalities were developing. And I would just remember watching this, watching this show and just being like, this is just the most exciting. <laughs> so, like, for me, it was just so like fun to watch and to be pulled into this world of human behaviour and how how we develop as people and our personalities especially child psychology was always an interest for me and um yeah and, and and one more thing actually this is quite crazy actually when I was about 11 years old or 12 I can't remember early adolescence I would I was I used to be obsessed with these books by an author called Tori Hayden mm -hmm. and all the books there was a whole series and they were all called things like the child who wouldn't talk and the teacher who saved her. And I, and I remember reading these books and just loving them and just getting like so um, lost in the world and just imagining that I was that teacher helping saving this child. And it was only until a few years ago, <laughs> it was only until a few years ago that I researched the name because I still remember this these books and how they like you know I was so involved and loved them and I just googled the, the name of the author and I it turns out that the author is a specialist in selective mutism and she, but she I can't remember her ever using that phrase Term. in the book so it's just crazy how you know everything seems all these little coincidences that were just putting me on that path. Wow, I'm honestly, and I, oh my God, like, sorry, just, I need a minute. Like, this is, this is, wow, this is such an evolution. Like, it was just like, you were so guided to this almost. It was almost like you, it was like trailed for you. So when you were watching this show with the development of these children, how old were you at the time, did you say? I would say early teen, maybe 12, 13, something like that. Wow. And about the same time, I was really interested in these books. Um, and then I'd also gone through the phase, or still going through, 
the inability to talk in Polish to certain people, or to people in Polish. Um, wow. Okay, so you know what, before we go further, I want to actually just put a little caveat here. And why don't we describe a little bit what selective mutism is so sure. people can follow along as we go, because that way they, they, have a, they have a better understanding before we jump to the next question. So what would, what, how would you, what would you say it is? What would you describe it Yeah, as? of course. <laughs> so selective mutism is an anxiety disorder. And people who have selective mutism can talk and talk comfortably in situations where they're at ease. So for example, the children I work with can talk freely at home with parents and siblings, but they're unable to talk in other situations such as at, at school. So children may be completely mute at school or they may only talk to a couple of friends in private. They might be unable to talk to a certain extended family and the majority of children are unable to answer strangers if somebody in the supermarket says what's your name or how old are you they freeze and they're unable to answer well, well thank you for that yeah because I, I want to yeah, i want everybody to make sure they follow along so um what i find really interesting about this process that you're describing and i did not know that i went that deep actually and that far back which is actually so fast i like i'm just blown away and i'm curious because a lot of us can really brush this intuitive uh, knowing or this intuitive process that you went through can brush it off and be like oh I got lucky and for instance when one of the situations that you described to me was that when you were doing a placement you were able to help this particular uh, child who had been mute throughout his duration at the school and then within three weeks of working with you you had this kind of you kind of made up this intuitive process to help him out of that uh, situation so when you realize you're like wow I kind of just made that up and I somehow knew what I was doing and kind of like one breadcrumb led to the other. How did you, what, like what evolved after that? Like, what was that process like for you? But I'm also wondering if there was a defining moment when you were like, this is for me. Like you were like, I know this is for me now. Mm, yeah. So over that placement year, I went, like I said, went to eight different schools and they were all super interesting. I loved each and every experience I had working with children with lots of different needs and um, learning. I learned so many skills, but working with that little boy with selective mutism, it was almost as though, how do I even describe it? <laughs> okay, so when I walked in, on the first day at that school, the head teacher was showing me around and I walked into this classroom and he said, you know, this is a reception classroom. And as soon as I walked in, I noticed this child who wasn't talking to anybody. And I commented on it immediately. And I said, why isn't he talking? And he said, he has selective mutism. And um, I just had this pull to help this child. And I said to the head teacher, I asked him whether I could work with this child while I was on my placement at that school and he agreed. And the whole experience was so powerful for me that there was this intuitive knowing of how to help this boy, but there was also the excitement and the interest of learning more. So I'd come home and be researching strategies, techniques, but I'd also be in the moment just trying things and they were working and this child who had not spoken for two years began talking to me for the first time and i just remember sitting in the book corner with him in his classroom and the first word he said to me was bear because we were i was reading an animal book to him and he said the word bear and i just remember this rush of oh my gosh he's he's done it and I'm just getting goosebumps, <laughs> like just oh, okay. telling you now. And it was just this overwhelming, like, okay, Lucy, stay calm. Just don't show any reaction. Just, have, just you know, I, I, inside myself, I wanted to, you know, just, it was- Like amazing. lift this kid up and be like, <laughs> you did it. Yeah. It was just the most amazing experience. And then to just see how that evolved. Once he'd broken down that first barrier, and then I helped him speak to, other ch like children in his class and then his teacher and by the end of that placement he was putting his hand up and answering questions in class and I just remember the whole thing was just 
magic happening before my eyes. Mm. An inc- the most incredible experience I'd ever had. And I realized that this boy's life has now changed. His whole, you know, his, his, the trajectory of his future is now different. And I remember on my, the last day at that school, I felt, oh my gosh, I'm leaving. He's, you know, I'm leaving. How's it going to be? But I could see that he was, he was almost elated. He was so happy that he now could talk. And it was almost as though I felt that, you know, he, he's, he'll be okay now. Mm. He was now able to talk. He was now able to be him. And yeah, it was, it was just the most incredible experience the most magical experience and I just knew that this is what I'm here to do I need to help more children who are currently unable to talk at school and the shocking thing for me at that time was that there was nobody really specializing in this that I could find um so in that school that child you know he'd, he'd been there for two years and the head teacher just said to me in a very casual way that you know selective um that psychologists have been in to assess him, speech and language therapists have been in to assess him, but nothing has worked. And at that time, I wanted to be an educational psychologist. That's why I was on placement, mm-hmm. um, learning, learning, learning about these different conditions. But then I realized that, you know, I haven't really seen an educational psychologist in the schools that I've been in. What I really want to do is be working with children in the classroom, just as I did with this little boy, I want to be hands on playing with them and helping them in real time. And that job doesn't exist. And I had this realization that if the job doesn't exist, then I need to create it. Oh, amazing. (laughs) So yeah, and I just realized that, you know, I don't want to work in office writing reports I don't want to be working for someone else. I want to do what I've just done. This magic that just happened before my eyes. I need to do it again. So then I just started to, um, yeah, the families just started to um, gravitate towards me. And soon people were wanting me to work with their child. And it just grew from there. And of course, I've then, did, you know, further training on selective mutism and um, started to, I traveled the world. I went to New York to, um, learned some strategies from there and um and started to make the youtube videos and it just kind of and what i what i truly believe is that we're all here to to share our unique talent with the world Mm. i believe that we all have something within us and when we find that thing everything will fall into place and there'll be synchronicities and the universe will support us on that path because that's what we're here to do especially if it's serving the world mm-hmm. and yeah, i really found that mm-hmm. just effortless that you know people were coming and situations were happening and yeah and it was just um it was i just knew that this is what i need to do I, as soon as i finished with that boy i knew that i need to now work with another child with this condition Oh my god, it just gives me, so then I, I guess it gives me goosebumps just to hear you say that because I just, it's, I find it so beautiful. So from that moment um, that you had worked with him, you said that's really where Confident Children started. But then you said you also worked um, as a teacher for a little bit, teaching psychology. So was the teaching just a job in the interim as you set yourself up to continue this work? Or was it, or was it kind of like a... Yeah, like what role did that serve for you before you actually were like 100% confident children? Like, I don't want to hear anything else kind of thing. Yeah, sure. You know, I feel as though we shouldn't resist things that come into our path. We should ride the wave. And, you know, teaching was something that I almost fell into. And I loved it. I really loved teaching psychology. It was so much fun I love the rapport I had with my students and it was just an amazing experience and it also gave me that space to have a stable job for three days per week so that I had the rest of the week to build confident children and I think that it's quite difficult for people to 
start a business or you know begin a venture from zero without having mm -hmm. any so teaching really gave me that space to um, have you know some stability while I was building confident children and of course it taught me so many taught me so much yeah. teaching taught me so much and gave me a lot of confidence to be able to talk in conferences and teach do YouTube videos and be in front of an audience because that's essentially what I was doing when I was teaching so I developed that side of me as well and there was that tipping point when I had to decide whether to leave teaching or not and it was a really hard decision <laughs> it wasn't easy because I really loved it but I knew that if I really want to make my mark and do what I'm here to do I need to devote fully to it wow oh I can imagine that moment where you're just kind of sitting there in your room like what do I do but for you I guess was it was it clear it was just or did it take a couple of days like was it a process or was it like no it was about six months <laughs> <laughs> okay I was reading the book called feel feel the fear and do it anyway mm. <laughs> because, oh wow <laughs> and it took about six months to make that decision to leave teaching and focus fully on confident children because it's scary when yeah. you have a stable job to take the leap and fully work on your own venture it's a risk you don't know if it's going to be successful or not you don't know whether you'll have enough work you don't you know it's 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 a it's a real unknown so mm. and also coupled with the fact that i really enjoyed teaching i loved it so yeah. it was hard to make that decision but again i kept telling myself that this is what i'm here to do and if i don't take the leap mm. then there'll always be a ceiling to what i can achieve there'll always be a you know children who parents who want me to work with their child but I can't because I'm working Monday to Wednesday teaching so there'll always be that barrier so I need to take that leap and again I know I trust that everything will work out as it should and even if I remember in feel the fear and do it anyway one of the key messages is that when we have to make a big decision we seem to think that there's one right decision and one wrong decision mm -hmm. and it's such so hard to make decisions because we don't know am i whether i'm making the right decision or not <laughs> so true but really if we think about it they're both right decisions because whatever decision you make you will grow from it you'll have learning mm -hmm. you'll have experiences and that whatever it is there'll be growth so in my mind I was thinking even if I leave my job and I start my business and it doesn't work out I'll learn how to cope with that situation I'll have that growth so it will be okay everything is figure outable everything will be fine <laughs> yeah it was a long process but yeah it definitely wasn't an instant decision no but hey, what a powerful way to believe and to continue to encourage yourself to think it's true that if I don't take this leap, I'll reach a ceiling and, and I won't necessarily feel like I'm creating as much impact as I could. So, so that's actually really powerful because when you started Confident Children, you mentioned what was the first thing you did to start the business? Like what's the first thing that generated the client or not client, but like the first case to call it like that or, or um, first parent. Okay, this you. is another great. <laughs> so the first paying parents so, so obviously when I was working in my placement that was you know placement so I was just in the school and I started to work with the child but again it's just crazy how things fall into place and how and I really believe this that as I've said already that when we're on path when we're doing good in the world when we have pure intentions and we want to make a difference the universe supports us everything works out the puzzle pieces form so the first paying parent was this is so good <laughs> basically my boyfriend at the time wanted to go to this event with a um uh speaker from the usa so 
he 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 was you know following this speaker and he wanted to go 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 to an event because this lady was coming to England. So um, I was going to join him <laughs> to go to this event, and we saw that, that you could have a store there to advertise your services, to give out leaflets and so on. So I emailed them and said, you know, I've just started this business called Confident Children. I've got some leaflets. Is it okay if I have a stall at the event and I hand out leaflets? And this lady is like a kind of like a life coach style person. So they replied saying, yes, of course you can have a stall. So that was that. The next day I received an email from the organizers and say, saying that someone else and someone who, another attendee who wants to attend our event has just got in touch. They live in London as well, just like you. And they've contacted us saying that they're attending the event and they really want help because their child has got selective mutism and she doesn't talk at school. And we told that parent that someone has got a stall at our event who, who is helping children with exactly this condition. Would you like me to put you in touch with this family? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, that was my first ever playing <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. So it's just crazy how... You know, I wouldn't have been able to make it up if I could I It just sounds so intricate, the pieces between like the organizers contacting and then that's... Exactly. So I emailed them telling them what I do. The next day, a parent emailed them. We're all both emailing America simultaneously from London. <laughs> yes. And then that person in America put us in touch. And then, yeah, and that was my, the first little girl that I've worked with and yeah the, and then it just kind of and then you know when you start to help and you start to get the results pet, just word of mouth started to spread and I started the YouTube and so on and it just grew from there but wow. it's, and were you ever nervous that you wouldn't be able to replicate the result after the first child well you know it's it's hard to think back so far it's almost a decade a decade ago now <laughs> Oh my um, gosh. Um, I think I was so excited uh, by the idea of helping this child and with each child now of course I know exactly you know it's so um, at that stage of course at the very beginning I was I spent a lot of time preparing each session it was my life and I would spend way more time than you'd imagine it was just almost an obsession so I'd really want to help this little girl and really understand her and what her interests are and create the session plans and so on so it just became such a part of my mission that I started to see results because normally people these children don't have somebody who is able to give them that amount of energy amount of focus they get lost in the busyness of the classroom when there are 30 children who are all you know <laughs> making a lot of noise and there's that one child who's not talking it's yeah. hard for them that it can sometimes go unnoticed so and and absolutely no disrespect to teachers because that of course how can they have that space and time to focus on that one child when they have 30 children to work with so it's really difficult so I suppose um I was doing everything I could help the child the parents could see that I was so dedicated to helping their daughter so it was a process a journey um but yeah, I can't remember if I had, I'm sure I did have doubts as I went. There's always ups and downs. But yeah, and it's like, yeah. yeah, but it's like you had the faith. You knew that um, you'd figure it out. There's, which is exactly. So actually, I actually want to dive into a little bit more of that personal emotional journey, because like you said, it's up and down and there are so many swings one way to the other, whether this decision or that decisions, right? So, um, it's really interesting to hear that you had the two influences of your, of your first, your mom, and then your nan, which I assume is your grandma, right? That's what you guys say. Okay. Amazing. So at some, because you had two really strong female influences 
And I, I like to ask this question because sometimes we gravitate to female stereotypes and we hang on to them as if they're, they're a barrier. So I'm curious, but at some point on this journey, because now you're a leader in this space, so now people look to you to learn, have you had to break away from female stereotypes or ways that you've identified um, in order to grow? Mm. It's an interesting one. I think that I'm quite lucky that I don't think I ever had the core belief that because I'm a female that I can't do something. So I don't think anything about being a female has held me back in my mind. Um, what I think more so is just perhaps the societal um, idea of as humans of what we should be doing. We should have a normal job, a nine to five, we should stay to what is known. We should just follow the normal path. And I think that was more of a barrier, which I think would affect females and males, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Um, the idea that we, um, to break away from the, the norm, the mold, and to do something different. Yeah, always takes that level of courage. So what would you say then, um, 10 years ago when you started this, I think you mentioned it's been, it's been 10 years, when you started this to now, in terms of like what you've had to learn emotionally and just what, and the doubts that you've had to overcome, what do you think has been a little bit of that evolution for you um, to make you feel so confident in what you're doing now? Yeah. I would say I would, I've had to learn to not put so much pressure on myself mm. I think in the early stages I would really want to help a child and feel as though if we're not getting the, the leaps quick enough that I'm you know I'd kind of put too much pressure on myself and now whenever I work for family I tell them from the very beginning that we can't guarantee how your child will respond to mm. the process I'll do, of course, everything I can to help them, but we don't know the pace they'll, re they'll respond. We'll have to be move at their pace. We'll have to adapt as we go. So I think it's really important to be honest with parents in the beginning and to take away the pressure from all angles. Mm. Because ironically, if we are at ease, then that will help the child to be at ease. Yeah. So I think I've had to learn that as well, to take away the pressure on myself which as a result takes the pressure off the whole process and I've also had to learn to not get affected by what other people think or that fear of what people think mm. because again breaking away from the mold of what is the norm how things even whenever you put anything out into the world, so I've been doing YouTube videos, I've written books and making courses and so on. It's quite a, um, in the reality of it, is that it's, it's quite exposing in a way. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first got my Eliza book in the post, it was, took, it was about two years of work to get this book, to, to put this book together. And I remember thinking that, oh my gosh, when I get the book, I'm going to be so excited. I'm going to be so like, yes, you know, celebrate. <laughs> yes. I remember getting the book in the post and my first feeling was, oh my gosh, now I need to put it out into to the world. Now I need to put it on Amazon. What if people don't like it? What if this, what if that? And I just remember feeling fear. That was my initial like thought, which is crazy to think that, you know, and that can be a real barrier and I think it can stop mm. a lot of people when just sharing their creativity with the world that fear of what other people will think oh my gosh that's so true and I really resonate with that it's true there's a certain like build-up towards anticip that anticipation of what people will think because it's really just an imagination as to what the reaction will be so what what how did you manage that like what did what what did you have what did you do what did you change to be like Maybe it was a languaging thing. I don't yeah, know. I, I would say 
it was, I remember after, with the Eliza example, I remember speaking to a friend of a friend who is a Buddhist. And I remember giving him that exact example and saying that, you know, I'm, I've just created this book and I'm actually, I thought I'd be so excited to share it, but I feel scared. <laughs> I'm worried about what people think. And he said to me, Lucy, your responsibility is to create and to share that with the world. It's none of your business what other people think about it. There can be mm. one cake and one person can love it and say that this is the most delicious cake I've ever tried. And another person can taste it and say, this is disgusting. So is the cake delicious or disgusting? It's, wow. it's neither. It's neutral. It's a creation. And it's, there will be different perspectives and that's okay. Other people's opinions have nothing to do with you. Your responsibility is to create and share. And that's it. That's the end of your role. So wow. <laughs> that helped me. <laughs> and yeah, so now I do, you know, I, I try to have that mindset. And there, especially if you are, you know, doing YouTube videos and doing creating content, you're not going to please everybody. There will be people who click dislike on your videos. And that is so hard and painful when you've created something with heart and love and you you're proud of it and you see that someone's disliked it it's, it's can be really painful but there's a point where you have to accept that that's a fact of life not everyone will like us not everyone will like what we do but you know we just have to keep going and keep moving forward and doing the best that we can oh my gosh you just I don't know you that was what a friend <laughs> what a guy that's <laughs> amazing advice that's wow that's beautiful because ever since then you've like put a lot out into the world like I think you have several pieces now that you've written and um and yeah your YouTube channel is quite followed obviously because I mean it's been a few years but also testament to the impact you're creating so actually I'm curious because we've talked a lot about like letting go of these fears and doubts what has been the most painful thing you've had to let go of on this journey for instance, just to give you, was it a belief? Was it a person, a habit? The one that cost you that you were like, you know what, I really had to let this die or let this person go. Um, or if there is anything, if not. I would say it was that fear of what will people think. Mm -hmm. yeah. That fear of wanting, you know, because we want people to like what we do and we want to, um, we want to be liked. It's a natural human instinct <laughs> so and when you when you're caught up in that pattern because sometimes i know it comes up like even even if you think you're like you know i don't care what do you say to yourself like what's something practical that you could give us like what is it something that you tell yourself maybe not to care so you don't care so much i say nowadays i say that this this too shall pass. So even if, luckily, thank God, I don't really have, I haven't really had any negative, you know, um, response at all. But it was just when I was creating those books or those programs and stuff, and I was worried about, you know, in my own mind. But now I tell myself, whatever happens, that will pass. It will be okay. It will be history. It might feel scary in the moment, just like when I published my book. I was so scared in that moment, <laughs> but now I don't feel scared. Yeah. It passes. And so, so everything is temporary and we can get through it. Mm. And, I, and I'm assuming you, you also experience that with the child as well. In a consistent basis, when you work with them, you see this like, wow, it's kind of like, it gives you a little bit as well. Wow, that's, that's, that's amazing. So now I want to highlight something. Um, we've highlighted the story of how it all started. So what would you say is your definite, so in this journey, like obviously you've experienced a lot of success and um, I'm curious because success is such a, a term these days, you know, it's like so coined to certain things and certain people or, so what, 
first, what is your definition of success and how is it different now than when it was when you started the university? And how has this definition, this evolution of the definition really empowered you? Oh, um, so I would say, first of all, at university, my definition of success was get good grades, get a good degree and get a good job. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably the goal to get a good job a stable job that was that was my definition of success at the time whereas now my definition of success is spending my days on my passion hmm. doing what I want to do and really feeling as though I'm making the difference that I know that I, as well as we, we all are here to make, mm. know that I'm, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to do, being on par. And that's completely different for everybody. For mm. some people being on path is having a, having a nine to five job. For some people that is their highest excitement and their highest alignment. For other people, it's not having a job at all and being a parent and devoting themselves to their child. That's their path and their alignment. And that is success. So it's really a case by case situation, a definition mm -hmm. of success. But I would say the ultimate answer is when we are living our highest excitement, when we wake up knowing that this is what I'm, I'm waking up to do what I'm supposed to do today, whatever that may be. Yeah. Wow. That's gives me shivers hearing that because it's so true. It's, it's, it's beautiful. So, um, what would be one piece of advice you'd give young females then to, would you say that that would be it? Listen to, listen to that intuition and follow, follow your highest, you called it excitement, which I really like but it's more like follow that path. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would say, don't be afraid to go off the path, the usual path that society dictates to us. Mm -hmm. Follow your heart. I know it sounds cliche, but if something is pulling you, like when I first came across that little boy, that was that pull. If I didn't listen to that, Mm. And the idea scares me if I didn't listen to that, actually. Really? Like, if I hadn't listened to that pull, how, maybe I would have got a normal job in an office or whatever. I can't even comprehend. So, <laughs> That's amazing. Like, we need to listen to that. When, I would say, going back a step, the, the advice I'd give to young women would be, number one, explore expose yourself to different experiences in order to find that thing that lights you up so because i had the the um opportunity to go to eight different schools and spend three weeks each at eight different schools i was exposed to all these different conditions and children and different um disorders that I could, and like I said, I loved the whole year. It was uh, incredible. But the experience of that child with selective mutism mm. was different to the it's others. Like... Exactly. So the advice would be to ex expose yourself to different experiences. And when <laughs> that little fire, <laughs> you know, lights within, follow it. Yeah. Nurture it continue to explore that path a bit more and a bit more and not everything will lead to a career or a big destination and that's okay mm -hmm. carry on doing this and then and then explore something else and and, and just keep on following that that whatever mm -hmm. it is that lights you up explore that and and trust in your trust in the the idea that 
that we are here to be do amazing things mm. we don't have to follow the normal grain if there's something that is a bit different then like i said if the job that you want to do doesn't exist then create it yeah yeah well that's well it's yeah it's 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 a bit of that internal leadership you know knowing that and recognizing it and then acting on it um, yeah wow and so when we talk a little bit more about confident children um i want to just can you tell us a little bit about like more about the mission going forward is it something that you're looking to grow um to be more than yourself or is it something that is just so close that you prefer to keep it um so in the past year and a bit year and a half yeah year and a half i have grown confident children so there's now four of us on this confident children team so Congrats. and that was a big um thank yeah. you that was a big step for me to take um, because confident children is has been very much my baby and i've really um yeah developed it created it so it was a big step for me to expand so we now have a couple of confident children practitioners who work with children just like I do and have the PA who helps who helps with the admin and um, emails and so on. So yeah, I have been growing confident children and that's been a real um, new direction in the last year or so. And in terms of moving forward, I would say that I'm really happy with where we're at in this moment and I never want to do something just because I should or that's what people say so I go to you know business events where people talk about expanding your business and you yeah. know make franchises do this do that <laughs> and when I've been told this in the past years it just didn't feel comfortable or in alignment within me so people have been telling me for years you know advertise um positions advertise and get people and you know get 20 practitioners in the next six months and blah, blah, blah. and for me i just felt that that's just forcing something that it, it, it just didn't feel right to me so i knew that the right people or person will come along at the right time I've always trusted that everything happens wow. as it should. Things work out and I don't have to force anything. I just have to be in alignment on path, carry on acting on inspiration. If I get an idea doing it and kind of being playful and continuing my mission and the right person or people will come along. And that's exactly what happened. I've never, advertise apart from for the uh, PA position I did interview a few people for that but for the people that work with children I've never advertised I've just known that the right person or people will come along and they did and when I was when they reached out to me I instantly knew that they're the right person wow I just knew that they've got that magic ingredient that isn't in everyone. It's not if I put an advert out there and said looking for a you know therapist to work with children, people might have the right qualifications or the right, you know, whatever, but I'm looking for an, a magic ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew that it, it will come to me. And when these um, two therapists reached out to me independently and I had um, contact with them, I knew they were the right person. So yeah, so, so I'm now in really comfortable with the team I have. I'm very happy with it. And I will let <laughs> the universe decide if that grows in the next year or if it stays the same. I'm not going to push anything. I will let things, I'll carry on doing what I'm doing and carry on having fun in the process and let things pan out. Wow. <laughs> you keep amazing me every time just with this intuition this like level of like just trust it's freaking amazing it's just 
you're right. Like we don't need to be anywhere else. We shouldn't push ourselves to be anywhere other than where we are. And, um, and I'm curious though, but when you, let's say, get an idea because a lot of us get ideas, right? And, or a lot of us, for example, hiring your first team member, they came to you. Did you purposely put an ad out there and, and just not look for the person? And they found, they was just like really out of the blue, they messaged you being like, are you, do you happen to be hiring? And also how did you know that it was the right time to hire? Like, was there, was there a moment where you were like, oh, okay. Hmm. It's time I think it's in, Yeah. I think it's important to stay open to opportunities. So I'm, I'm an open person. So if I receive an email from somebody who's inquiring, I will be open, but I also trust my gut and my, the, the feeling I have within. So I didn't put any advert out and I've been receiving, I always receive emails from people saying, you know, can I do a placement with you or can I work with you or can we do like, you know, people reach out to me a lot. And I, I just, I got the emails and I just, each time I just listen <laughs> within and up until this point, I didn't have that feeling that yes. So I replied to these people politely saying, thank you for your email. And at the moment I'm not looking to expand or I have someone already and that's fine. And I kind of just, if I'm not, if, if, if I don't have that inner knowing, then I don't act on it. Mm -hmm. So that's when I got brilliant. these from these specific practitioners, when I, when I, when they emailed me, I just had this moment that I just, yes, they're the, they're the ones. And of course I, you know, I'm very sensible um, and I have to protect confident children. So we had a process of, um, you know, we'll just start with uh, one child maybe and we'll I'll be, we'll be monitoring how it goes and I'll be giving you a lot of support and etc 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 so I was very much um guiding the person initially but still I really did trust my intuition in the process wow it's just uh, I'm just like blown away. It gives me goosebumps. Even just the whole story. Oh, about how you, yeah, it's just it's so your story is so beautiful and it's just so inspiring. So actually, something that I, I want to touch base on because um, you bring up, but in, in conversation, I, I, I refer to confident children as a business, and then you were like, Yvonne, <laughs> one thing I want is that even though it's a registered business and it's how you make a living, let's say. You prefer not to call it that way. And I'm curious as to understand um, what that does for you and, and why that is. Well, it's, <laughs> it's not that I don't like to call it a business. It's rather that when somebody is talking about a business, the idea, the instant idea that comes into mind is that this is a thing I do to make money. I'm making this product that's going to make me money. I'm going to you know whereas with confident <laughs> children even though I'm so grateful that it's how I make my living that's not the first um reason why I do it it's my passion and it's my life purpose and even if I wasn't able to make money from it I would still do it it's my essence it's what I'm here to do so for that reason, it's, I, 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 it's not the same, um, I don't have the same feeling as I've, I'm starting a business. And when I go to, for example, um, business events and to network with entrepreneurs and so on, because I feel that's important to do as well, to meet successful people and to network with them, quite often people at these events talk about their sales strategy and <laughs> you know their marketing yeah their marketing and things like that and for me that's so alien because I don't have a sales strategy I don't do marketing I share my knowledge my passion to make videos wanting to share information that will help people and then families reach out and want me to help their child Mm -hmm. And I never try to sell to a family. I never try to use any tactics or whatever. 
instead I tell them what I can offer and it's up to them if they want to want to me to work with their child or not it's not it's there's no kind of you know strategies behind it so it's rather a human to human connection speaking to that parent and just mm-hmm. understanding where their child is at and if they want further support or not it's up to them so it's it's really just um a passion and a life purpose which i'm very fortunate is also the way that i have my living you know it's so it's so beautiful and i wanted to bring that up because i think a lot of us can try and pigeonhole some passions or ideas or things that we want to do into these constructs and i think the way that you've done it is so beautiful because you've allowed it to still function as that but um identified and, and recognize that that's not what at the end of the day there's there's something deeper about that so mm-hmm. i think i think it's beautiful and and i remember talking to you and i just thought you know this could help so many people that are just trying to make this a business which changes in many times the priority and mm-hmm. um the values so that's really interesting so actually i i, I before we before we start to close i just wanted to ask you if you were to distill to one thing like what's the biggest reason why you do what you do like what's what what is the bigger impact or the bigger picture you're looking to have like your deeper why yeah it's my first thought (laughs) was it's to help as many children with selective mutism as possible and that is the bigger reason it's to help as many children to find their voice to overcome their anxiety to be their true self to shine to help as many children as possible but at the same time it's those individual children that I work with and having those moments with each child it's just magic working with just one on that one-to-one level and to see to see their whole, to see them come alive to see them be oh, able yeah. to finally put their hand up in class and answer a question to see that the whole new world has opened up to them is just the most special experience i could imagine i remember um just to give you an example i was working with a boy a few months ago and he was he's about 10 yeah 10 and he hadn't spoken to a teacher in his life or to any children at school and I went to his house for a couple of home sessions and he began talking to me and he said but how are you going to help me at school I don't want to talk at school but how how can you help me and I explained to him the process and and then he was so ready for it he was so ready for it he just needed somebody to just implement and just do it and guide him take his hand and just put all those pieces of the puzzle together and in that week it was just like he on the you know he just started talking to the teaching assistant and then the teacher and then we brought in friends and it was just like a he was just ready at each challenge I gave him he grabbed with both hands and by the end of the week he was talking you know in the to, to everyone in the class it was just like oh at the end of that week I just have to take a moment to just be be like what just happened what just happened (laughs) like he's it's it's just just the most amazing experience that I am so grateful that I get to spend my days doing I can't imagine doing anything else so that's my why (laughs) I just see radiating, radiating out of you. It's beautiful. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wow. It's so, 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 so nice. And I'm sure I could actually talk to you about this for hours because I could, there's just, this is just beautiful. So just to actually close, I want to close on one last question. And I'm just wondering how does you take care of so many children and you're really there for them. And in many ways you're there for many families. Um, and you really support them and, you know, bring them together in many ways, open up some little boy or little girl's life. So I'm wondering, how do you take care of yourself? So how do you, who, who, how do you take care of yourself? And do you have any self-love rituals or how do you stay sane in all this? In all yeah, your work? that's a great question. 
And I'd say that's also something that when you said, what have I learned over the years? That's also something that I have learned to um, develop within myself, separating or having that work-life balance because mm -hmm. confident children is so my essence it can really take over. And even though I love it and it, I, I, I have so much fun, it's really important to also have times when I'm not focusing on confidence. <laughs> you know? yeah. So in terms of self-love rituals, I, I love traveling, mm. love to spend time with friends, of course. I love doing fun things um, and I, I try to spend some time every day just, and I'm not perfect, <laughs> definitely not, but doing some yoga, going for a walk to the park. I love walking in the park and listening to music and just clearing my head and just, you know, just walking and just allowing myself to have a break, have a, some mental space and just be in nature. I love to do that. Mm -hmm. Reading. Okay. Yeah. And do you read anything outside of like psychology? Yeah. Or self development? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> I, I really do like um, personal development books. I don't know if that's not, it's probably still psychology. But <laughs> it's I really so old, do. Yeah. <laughs> slightly, slight, loosely linked. But yeah, I do like to read uh, books. For example, I was reading a book recently called Atomic Habits. Ooh, good. Which, yeah, it's a great book. Oh, have you have you read it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was great because again, it's uh, te teaching us to have incorporate those habits into our life. That meditation or yoga or that walk or whatever that can easily be forgotten about, or we want to do it but we just never get around to it. Or healthy eating or whatever. So um, yeah, so I love to read books that are um, about how we can develop ourselves further and be the best version of ourselves oh my god i guess you're always you're always trying to grow it's beautiful so just to close i'm wondering is there any content um that you recommend that really inspires you or that you'd want to share that you're like you know what I, you mentioned a really good book uh, at the beginning the one that pushed you kind of off the edge to to start your business so i think that's it we'll put that in the notes but is there any other content that you'd like to read or consume i guess yeah um so that, the first book was feel the fear and do it anyway <laughs> i read that book which was a big change maker for me atomic habits a recent book and there was another book which really impacted me called i can see clearly now mm. by dr wayne dyer and wayne dyer was a spiritual teacher who is super inspiring i love watching his videos one of his quotes is don't die with the music still in you mm. so that's <laughs> a big <laughs> kind oh. of part of my philosophy to life as well and in his book i can see clearly now he speaks about each part of his life so all of his experiences so there's a chapter on you know when he was five years old and he had a certain experience when he was 10 years old so he talks about all these experiences he's had and after each experience he then says i can see clearly now and he explains how that experience that he had was a positive for his life so even if in that moment it was hard it was a challenge it was a really difficult experience he's then reflecting on that and saying i can see clearly now why that had to happen why that has made me who i am wow. so that's that book i can see clearly now is a book that i really liked well actually i should read it again because i haven't read it for a few years but i remember reading that and just thinking wow that's uh, an amazing way to look at life mm. I actually haven't read it. I'm just going to look it up because I always love to, I'm like you, I love consuming this kind of content and just seeing like how I can improve and, and uh, just get those nuggets. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, I love Wayne Dyer too. He's just so wise. Exactly. Yeah. <sighs> and man. his other quote, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Oh, yes. 
it's so funny actually i was remembering that quote the other day when i was walking i was like wow this is just so much life it's just yeah that is life it's just how we see it all right so is there anything that you would like to share with us before we close that you think that we didn't touch on i one of the things that i really wanted to bring up was the process that you go through with the kids and as well as like giving some tricks to parents but i feel like i'm just going to refer everybody to some of the content you have on youtube because that will probably serve them a little bit better than if we try to you know go through it too quickly here so but is there anything else that you feel like that you'd love to share with us before we close Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I would say really echoing that message that we all have a unique talent to share with the world. We all deserve to shine and to share ourselves and our beauty with the world, whatever that, that is that we have within us, just as Wayne Dyer says, don't die with your music within you. If you've got a, mm. a pull to paint, to, to create music, to make food or whatever it may be, if you've got a pull, it's so often that we kind of ignore that because we focus on what's important, dealing with the day-to-day -day things that just bombard us. And we can get almost lost in that. But those things are just as important, if not more important than the day to day things. Mm. So if you always love to paint, if you always love to write stories, carve out time to do that. Mm -hmm. Spend time on your passions, nurture that and allow that to come out. And also the second message would be be authentically you mm. so allow yourself to be yourself and that can be so mm. hard because we're trained by society to be in a certain way probably <laughs> people wouldn't advise someone to do a book reading in a unicorn onesie <laughs> but, <laughs> but the children loved it they loved it the parents told me that their children woke up buzzing and that because i allowed myself to be me and i'm mm. so grateful that like i said at the beginning beginning of this my mum has really given me that message she's because she doesn't follow social norms and <laughs> she just is just herself and very eccentric i've just learned to do these things just to be just to be me and i'm so grateful for that message i remember last summer i was with my mum in poland by a lake and we were listening to music and my mum said to me why don't you get up and dance right now and i said to her like mom that's embarrassing i can't do that like, you know. <laughs> and she was like lucy if you want to dance you should dance and i i just thought i'm so lucky that I have that message because mm. a lot of people don't have that message. So be you, <laughs> shine your light. And that's, you know, that's the way forward in my opinion. Oh, I, you know, I really would love to be your mom. <laughs> she sounds like an incredible woman. I am. Yeah, that's true. We all need to hear that. We all need to be reminded that um, we need to break away from that mold or box and just be ourselves it's wow well thank you so much for sharing that i'm curious how can people find you some people want to follow your journey and continue on yeah, what sure. you're doing so my website is confidentchildren.co.uk and my facebook page is confident children selective needs and therapy and my youtube channel is confident children so you can find me okay. on all those channels Pretty easy. And I'll leave it in the notes below. So that way it's all, uh, it's all there for everybody. Great, but, and just to close, is there, what is the best way this community can serve you? You support us and you help and you're doing incredible work. So is there any way that we can support you? Whether it's oh, by following thank you. Your it's kind. Or, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe liking my Facebook page, sharing my videos, most importantly to, to spread awareness of selective mutism, because it is a condition that, mm -hmm isn't very well known 
So if people can share videos, I've got a few videos about like from a parent's perspective, what parents want the world to know about selective mutism. So if people have a look at those videos and share them and help it become a more well-known condition, that would be beautiful. <laughs> Amazing, we will do that. Lucy, thank you so much for such a beautiful, beautiful episode for just sharing with us so vulnerably, so openly, and just for being such a light. Um, I think it's really examples like you that um, help us all live more and more happily with more clarity, with more magic inside of us. And so thank you so much for being who you are and continuing to create that magic that you do every single day. So thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, was that not incredible? Lucia's story is just so real. It is just, we can, I, I feel like I can relate to that. I hope that you could really feel that, you know, your entire life, there, there has been wisdom and there has been guidance and then we just have to tune into it. We have to listen. And, and just as Lucy said, there's, there are gifts inside of us that nobody else can do and we just have to act on them. So I really hope you left inspired after this episode to just continue shining bright. And Lucy, thank you so much for the work that you do, not only for the kids and the families, but also for the community. And uh, I look forward to seeing how this journey evolves for you. I will leave your details in the notes below so that people can follow along on your journey as well. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning in for another wonderful week. And I look forward to seeing you next time.